They call this podcast Deep Sheet, honestly. <laughs> Michael Chopra. Um, I've got to get straight into it. Michael Chopra, the first player who could have been British-born playing for India. Does that, um, does that mean anything important to you? Well, yeah, it did. Um, I could have been the, the first player that had played in the Premier League to also represent the Indian national team as well. And I tried to do it, but for whatever strange laws... But you've got to give up your citizenship. You've got to give up a UK citizenship for that. Well, yeah, you've got to give it up. You've got to live in the country for so long in India. Um, and I tried it. We spoke to the lawyers about it, solicitors. Uh, everything, we, what we tried, it just was not possible. And it's a shame because you've got so many British Asians that are not only playing in Premier League teams, but in championship teams that can play for the Indian national team. And... It could help India become a better team. I know I'm not saying disrespect to the Indian boys now, but they're not as good as some of these players. And these players could help the team and they can get higher up in the rankings. So a question I've got for you on this is, do you feel Indian? Uh, do, you, do you feel it would be appropriate if you did play for India? Well, I, I, I class myself as Indian. I class myself as in English. Um, you can't have it both ways. <laughs> well, my, 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 my dad's Indian, my mum's English, so I'm, I'm in between, I'm split, you know what I mean? But I wanted to, to... My first priority was England, and I believed when I was a kid that I'd always play for England one day, growing up through the, through the ranks, playing for the youth teams, etc. And once I realised that wasn't possible because I believed political and other views at why somebody else got chosen ahead of me. Um, I then decided to go down the Indian route and in 2011 I think it was when I got my OCI card. Um, OCI? Overseas Citizenship of India. I believe that was the process that I first took to for me to play for India. I've got to go back to, to your childhood. You said your father Indian, yep. your mum uh, English. You're born in rough tough Newcastle <laughs> did you suffer racism no which is very strange um, may, maybe because you look at me and you wouldn't think I was Indian uh, you would only know I was Indian by the surname um, Chopra so I've been lucky that I didn't come across that and I've played in teams I'll use Shola Miobi as an example I played in the same team as Shola playing for the city and, and he got racially abused and I think it was like 13, 14 and it wasn't nice at all and thankfully for me I've not really come across that in, in my life. Because I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, I was thinking that might have been one of the reasons that you actually became such a controversial character <laughs> late, later on in your career so I was, I was going back. You played a really good standard football right the way through yeah. England, 16, 17, 18, 19. 20 yeah. that must have been fantastic yeah it was brilliant um i was at school and i was getting a, a call up letters coming through the post telling my mates at school i think what i enjoyed most is going to the teachers with a letter saying by the way i'm not going to be in school this week i'm playing for england <laughs> and i'd done all i could to to try and skip school and, and get out of lessons but no it was a it was a dream come true um I remember my, my first time I ever got called up for England uh, was in the, the Victory Shield, under 15. Under 15, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Big and, game, Wembley? Well, let me tell you a story. So we, we've done the medical and everything, and they found a very, very rare heart condition with me. It was called Wolf Parkinson White, and it's like one in 3,000 people have the syndrome. So they wouldn't let me play and I was absolutely devastated because I'd been named on the team sheet and doctors come and said, look, we can't take a risk until we do some more ECGs and, and get them properly tested. So for like literally six months, I was back and forwards with the FA, with the, the hospital they put me in, the doctors to find out what the problem was. And then eventually I got the all clear to play for them. Uh, I think it was Republic of Ireland was my first game for England in the 15s and it, it, was, it was a dream from you just to step on the over the white line with the three lines on my chest. So the, the Victory Shield for those back home, it, it's, it's one of the biggest occasions that uh, uh, an English schoolboy can, can yeah, play in. Right, yeah. And yeah. so clearly at this time of, of life, you're, you're absolutely in love with football. Mm. Football is probably your life. You live it, you breathe it, yeah. you kick the ball, you kick the pillow, you do everything. You love the game. Yeah, uh, used to go to sleep watching uh, 
at that age it was like 93 to 96 when I was wanting to that's really when I was banging to football and Newcastle United were called the entertainers of course they were so you had Peter Beardsley and Andy Cole and I was watching videos going to sleep watching the videos and I used to I always remember I used to before I used to go to sleep, I used to shut my eyes and I used to dream that I was like playing in the same team as Peter Beardsley, Andy Cole, Rob Lee, that, them type of players. Um, and you always dream about being a professional footballer and thankfully for me, one day it happened. Okay, you became a professional footballer mm. and then gambling somehow kicked in. Yeah. How can you lose that love for football and, 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 and then be gambling? What, what, what happened? What, what was the key to it? Because it's because you could have been really up mm. there because the, yeah, you're playing yeah. under 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. That's a great roadmap. Something went wrong on the way. I think, the, I think when I went into the gambling, I think a lot of people started to lose respect for me. But how do you get into the gambling? That's right. my first question. So I think it was when I was about 16 slash 17. Seriously? Wow. Yeah, so first of all, what happened is we'd all meet up at uh, St James's Park as uh, YTS youth team players. We'd get the bus to Durham, train. Straight after that, there was probably five, six of us. Uh, we'd be waiting for the metro, so we the train. We what time's it? Oh, we've got a half an hour. Let's go into the amusements. Let's play on the arcades. Okay. And it was only one pound, two pound slot machines. Um, what? How much money were you on at this time? Probably about seventy-five pound a week. Okay. Which is For a 16 year old, it's good money. Yeah, it's y YTS wages. You sign a contract, that, that's the minimum uh, money you can get paid. And then as soon as you turn 17, then you, you're a professional player, you, your money goes up. Uh, so I think really it was probably 16, 16, I think it was, when I started to play on these stupid machines. Okay, how does it develop from there? So it started to develop when I then started to travel with Newcastle United. So once I hit, once 17 come, I was playing for the reserves on a regular basis. Uh, I started to travel with the first team. And one of the uh, tours we came was to, to, to KL, Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, you're not blaming KL, are you? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so I, I, I was on the, on the aeroplane and I'm sitting there and I'm minding my own business, watching big players playing cards, having a card scroll. And then I just start thinking, I'm on £500 a week, big pile of money like that in the kitty. And I'm watching these players playing, they're just bang, 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 bang. And I'm thinking, it's just luck of cards. Surely if I win one of them pots, you, pff, your life changes. And you don't think about what happens afterwards and, and getting into it and being, an, being having it as an addiction. But I think it was then really that I really got into it. Um, and then, as I'm getting more involved with the first team, you're looking at the big name players that are involved in it. There was probably 10 players that are involved, half the team. And um, I'm thinking to myself, I've got to, I want to be surrounded by these players. These are international players. I want to, I want to be in with a circle. So you're kind of saying that this is, uh, th these are idols in many ways. Yeah, yeah. And so you're following the example of your idols. Was there any good influence on you at this stage? Was there any, redeeming factor to stop you getting in? I think this is terrifying to me. Well, on a, on, a, on a football pitch, I had all the players helping me, uh, but off it, I don't think they really seen it as a problem, do you know what I mean? It's, you, you're playing cards, you're passing over time, uh, you, you're taking money off, off players that you're playing with, your teammates, but for them, it's, it's not out of control. They are playing, within their, their needs, what, what they earn and that sort of thing. But if, if you're putting two, three thousand pounds onto a, a, a game of cards, yeah. your heart, which is already dodgy, your heart is going boom, 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 boom. Doesn't that give you some kind of insight that, hey, this, this is a bit daft? Well, you, I, I didn't think it at the time. I just thought I'm playing cards with Alan Shearer, Kieran Dyer, uh, Craig Bellamy, Gary Speed, Shea Given, Jermaine Genus, Titus Bramble. These are like the biggest players. This in... doesn't paint them in a good light, you know? Well, they, they, they know that they, they were playing cards, do you know what I mean? So it's, it's one of them things. I was part of a card school with them and I, I wanted to, to be close to them. 
and if I, I thought if I was close to them, then I'd have to, I'd be playing cards with them on a on a regular basis because you're in the circle, you're in with them. Do you know what I mean? That sort of thing. But it's not down to them that they made me a gambler. It's me, I, I chose to go down that route. Do you know what I mean? So after the cards, how does it take on? Because you the, the, there's talk about the, the horses and the yeah. and, and and serious serious amounts of betting that, that caused you immense financial problems. Yeah. So it was uh, one once you're not playing cards. Um, I would then find, try and find another buzz. So once I'm playing football, scoring goals, yes. I've got such a high and everything. Now I want to re recapture that, that buzz. So if I'm betting on a horse and it gets up on the line, it's, it's a good feeling, do you know what I mean? But I don't think about what happens if it gets beat. Didn't, didn't come in my mind. And then I had, um, if I wasn't playing, I would be be just so disappointed, so I'd want to just be in my own space. And whenever I used to go to the to the betting shop, it was just me betting. Nobody could come into my into my space. It was just me and the bookies. That was it. I played football to a, a semi-pro level. Mm. One of my dreams would have been to get even close to, yeah. to, to the level. So to hear that the pros are, are abusing their time in that way is is really dispiriting. Um, I don't, I don't, it's hard to say abusing. It's, I think it was just a, a case of them um, passing over time, and like I said, they were gambling within, within what, their they, yeah, within what, their they, what they could afford. Whereas me, it got stupid. Um, what does stupid mean? Well, I, I was on probably 500 a week, and I remember putting 3,000 into a kitty, oh, yeah. and it was only. One of the play, one of the players actually, the players actually did help me then, because uh, it could have kept going up. I, I thought I had a decent hand, and I remember Lee Bowyer telling me, "Look, chops, you can't beat me." And I'm like, "No, no, no, no." He says, "No, no, I'm doing you fair. You can't beat me." And and Bowes knew what what I was earning, and he he, he just said, "Look, there you go. I'm, I'll turn them over. I've got three threes, which is the best hand you can't lose." So he he done me a favour. Do you know what I mean? He he probably realised that. Uh, with rumours going around that it was possibly getting out of hand with me. So he was trying to help me as well uh, by saying, look, you can't beat me. So this is still Newcastle days. This yes. is still relatively early yeah. in your career. You then moved on to Cardiff, where I, I was fortunate enough to yeah, watch yeah, you yeah. a few times. And you were the pride of Cardiff yeah. as they were coming through the, 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 the Dave Jones team. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, a brilliant team, yeah. exciting. Cardiff's never had a team like this, <laughs> not since the 20s. Yeah. So you get the buzz, so the football buzz is still there. It didn't seem to be impacting your football, but talk what? to me about Cardiff as the club first. And then I want to talk about what to me is very strange. You're still gambling. Mm. So Cardiff is a club. I, I, went, I knew Peter Ridsdale from when I went on loan to, to Barnsley. So I knew about his drive and, and focus for the football club. Um, so I went down there, met Peter, met uh, Dave Jones, the manager. He told me the plans and he had massive plans for Cardiff. The players that he wanted to sign, um, he said to me, you sign for Cardiff, I'm definitely bringing in Steve McPhail. Uh, Steve McPhail, I played with Barnsley and was, was brilliant for me. Yeah. I make a run, he would pick me out no matter what. Um, so Maka came as well, and he signed. He signed other big players. We had good young players coming through the ranks. Joe Ledley, Aaron Ramsey was a young boy. Kid, yeah, he was yeah, 16, yeah. 17, yeah. So we, 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 there was, there was, the potential at Cardiff at the time was massive. Um, so I, I spoke to Sam Haman, who was the one of the yes, owners at the yes. time, and he was funny. He was cracking the jokes and everything, and his passion for the football club as well. It, it meant a lot to me, and they always said to me, if, if you love Newcastle fans, you'll love the Welsh fans. He says, because they're exactly the same. They go to work nine till five, Monday to Friday, and they live and die for football at the weekend. And I decided to- In Cardiff they do, in other parts of rugby, <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. But no, and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to, to sign for Cardiff, was because I wanted to be, a hero for them and I wanted to be loved again. You were loved? I could have stayed at Newcastle. I got offered a new contract by Freddie Shepherd, 
But I was thinking, Alan Shearer's just left. They're definitely going to bring in a new number nine, and that's going to drop me down the pecking order. Uh, so I just thought, nah, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go to Cardiff. I could have went to other clubs and, and things like that, but I decided to, to go and sign for Cardiff. All the while, you've still got this gambling yeah, problem. Yeah, still got it. Is it a problem to you at this stage? Do you know what? It was ne I, it was I just thought it was never a problem until later on in my career. Uh, but yeah, I was still gambling, and even even to this day, people people still don't understand how I could gamble like I was doing and still play the football that I was doing. It's that's my next because question. That's my next question. People think that because I'm gambling, going to bed, it. One o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, set my alarm for four o'clock in the morning to watch a, a Brazil game in Argentina, placing a bet. I'm putting a bet on it. Putting a bet on it. And then waking up for training at like six, seven in the morning, have my breakfast, go to training. They didn't quite understand how, how I could do it and then produce what I was producing at the weekend. So how did you do it? Because we think <laughs> fine athletes. At, at that level, certainly in 2006, yeah. it's, it's post Wenger. Yeah. It's, uh, the diet's meant to be good. You've yeah. got to look after your body. Your body is a temple. No boozing, no, uh, uh, look, looking after your sleep patterns. And you're telling me something completely different. Well, diet, sleep. Um, my diet and sleep were horrendous. Absolutely shocking. So I've got a match ball from Cardiff. And on the match ball, the fitness coach has actually put you can have a pint of Coke anytime you like. So I played a game, um, might have been, I can't remember which, which one it was, but I was feeling I needed a big sugar boost. So I went and go and get me a pint of Coke from, it was like, where Before a game? Half time. So I was, he was like, where am, I, where am I going to get a pint of Coke? I was going to the players lounge, try and get me a pint of Coke. So neck a pint of Coke, scored a hat trick. And he's like, so, Got the match only sign it. You can have a pint. Seriously? Of, yeah, seriously. You can have a pint of coke anytime you like. And then another time, I think we played Watford away, and uh, just on the bus and that we we travelling and stuff like that. Lads, I'm passed down. I'm sitting there with one of these uh, restless burger that you put in the microwave five minutes, heat it up, and I'm just I just eat so much junk food in it. I don't know if it was because when I was training. I was training at a high intensity that I was just burning all the calories. Because you were skinny, you were, you were yeah, yeah, slim as a race all the way through, yeah. 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 And, I knew, and quick. Yeah, so my speed was one of the main points of my game. So I had to train how I played. Uh, I, would, I would train hard, I would work hard in training and try and burn off as many calories as possible because I knew all the stuff that was going into my body. It wasn't good for me, but it tasted nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're watching a podcast called Deep Sheet. We're talking to Michael Chopra, who's uh, dispelling some myths. Um, we'll get back onto the gambling because we're only yeah, halfway yeah, through yeah. that stage. But it's not the only drama you've had in your life. No. You've, you've, you've got a bit of a record with, with uh, women. Yeah. Um, some very public breakups. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd been with my ex-wife um, from school. Okay. Uh, so it was around about 16. 16, I think it was. And she came with me up until uh, we got divorced when I think it was when I was at Sunland. Yeah. Just on the verge of signing for Cardiff the second time. Um, but we were fine, everything was happy. And But I started to play in the Premier League with Newcastle. Yeah, you, uh, you start going on nights out with the first team players. You're starting to get women chucking themselves at you. And my mind's starting to wander at different places and, and that sort of thing. So, I, and then, we had a little boy, uh, Sebastian. Yeah. Uh, he was born in February 2008, and we decided to get married uh, in June, um, about five months later. And at the age of 24, I was probably too young to get married, and especially um, playing in the Premier League. You've got a young boy now, mate. Yeah, I didn't, I, do you know what? I, I don't think I, I didn't think like that. I was thinking Premier League footballer. I thought I was bigger, better than anything that was coming my way. Um, and I look back and, yeah, I'm disappointed at what happened, but I can't change it. It's life you've got. I have to move on. Um, How's your relationship with uh, Sebastian? It's, it's not what I would want it to be. Um, I speak to him every now and again. I just think because of the situation, what happened with, with my ex-wife, Heather, she kind of distanced Sebastian from me. Um, Fairly? 
I don't think it's fair, you know. But she wants him to grow into a nice boy, a nice man, teach him values of life, that sort of thing. And she doesn't believe with what I've done in life that he should be around that. He should know about that at, at, at such a young age because he's only 12, he's just turned 12. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I s still speak to him as much as I can, play computers against him and that sort of thing and see him whenever. Is Heather a good mum? Yeah, I think she's a good mum, yeah. Okay. I think she's uh, turned Sebastian into a, a, a good boy, a nice gentleman. And he's, he's very polite as well, so I can't complain when she's raising my kid like that. It's, it makes me, I, I, I see him, he went to the Newcastle game the other day and sent me uh, pictures and it makes me proud. Um, but I wish that I could be in his life a lot more. Mm. Okay, very sad. Yeah. Um, a little bit more humorous for those who are reading yeah, about yeah. it though, was the way you split up. Yeah, um, so we got married and six, seven months afterwards, um, things weren't really going to plan. Um, so we were arguing all the time. This uh, is after you've been together, what, for six, seven years? Yeah, by yeah, this stage? yeah, I think the stress of having a baby, trying to get married, putting a wedding, a big wedding on, uh, I think it all come on top of us. And then obviously me playing in the Premier League, which is pressure in itself, knowing you've got to fully focus, you've got to perform to your best, otherwise you're out of the team. Um, it just all really came on me. And then obviously when I was gambling, to have all these in my life, it kind of spoiled the relationship. I'm just thinking of all of these distractions going on. I'm still gobsmacked that you're actually able to turn in. <laughs> what, you were a goal every three games throughout yeah. your career in Cardiff, you were a goal every other game or, yeah. or, 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 or yeah. something. So you must have been training like a dervish. There must have been some good influences on you. I mean, I know, I know you rate Dave Jones very yeah, highly. Yeah, yeah. So obviously when, when I was at Cardiff the first time, uh, the gaffer knew all about my problems. And he was, what, what can I do to help you? And I was just, the Scouse lad, see? Yeah. <laughs> so I was just like, just let me enjoy my football. If you let me enjoy my football, I, I promise you, I'll give you 100% every game. That's all I said to him. I said, in training, I love to do shooting drills. I love playing five aside, seven aside. I said, just don't make it boring for me because if it's boring, then I'll, I'll, I can't do it. It's, it. It doesn't interest me. So he, he, was, he was brilliant with me, made it as fun as possible. He, he asked me what type of player I should bring to the club. Um, to play alongside you? Yeah. So, so you were integral to the way yeah, you wanted yeah. to play? Yeah, he, he, it was brilliant. It was like, I come from Newcastle, being a, a, a second team player substitute, to then being a focal point at Corner yeah. City yeah. and to being a big, a big player. Um, but yeah, so he would discuss teams, tactics, um, how does he want me to play and, and that sort of thing and it was it, it was it was really really good really interesting so for me. So doesn't this help you mature because I can't square this I, I'm a senior member of a team taking this responsibility on you're not looking after your boy you're gambling Where, why didn't you mature what didn't work in your own brain? I don't know I honestly don't know because some the coaches used to call me Peter Pan where the little boy that never grows up, uh, but they could see that I, I, I was producing, so they would just leave me to it. Mm. And I think if you I wasn't that a lot actually, didn't you? If I wasn't producing the goods, yeah. I think they would have helped me a lot more. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying they didn't try and help me and that sort of thing, but and it's like myself. I think if I wasn't producing and scoring goals on a regular basis, I would have went. Hang on a minute, I need to take a step back. I need to concentrate on my diet. I need to stop playing computer games and I need to stop gambling. But it was like going Saturday, bang, bang, go, let's gamble, let's play computer, let's have a late night, that sort of thing. And, it was, and then it just it started to become a regular thing. Wow. But the gambling had spiralled out of control yeah. by this stage. It forced you to move away from this club where you've been given mm. such a central role, such a central responsibility. Um, talk to me about how the gambling spiraled and how, not why, but how. So, oh, well, how you earn more money. Uh, so I had a close of my contract at Cardiff that if I, I think it was if I scored 15 goals, I'd get a new deal. I'd done that by December. Yeah, yeah. So they give me a new deal. My wages doubled. Uh, I'm getting, to what? 
Uh, they went from six to 12. 12,000 pounds yeah. a week? Yeah. Serious money. Yeah, it is serious money, especially back in the day. Um, but it was more money for me to bet. Mm. Um, obviously, that's yeah. not what it was meant for. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> but I, don't, I didn't think like that. Obviously, you, you buy nice things, you can buy a nice house, and that sort of thing. But there's still, I just thought I can start raising the stakes. So, so at your worst, how much were you betting, and on what? Uh, I think you could probably go up to. I was placing one bet about 40,000 40, at, at times. Yeah. Forty thousand yeah, pounds yeah. on a single bet. Yeah. Did you win? No. I can, I can laugh about it now, but at the time I was absolutely devastated. I, I just want to bring this to, to the current day. In the betting um, websites are across, emblazoned mm. across all the Premier League teams, um, betting is very much a part of the English Premier League. Yeah. It, and uh, Your advice to that would be to, to get rid of it? Well, I think clubs have stopped the players betting from what I see and to the later part but they're of still putting well, this these is what betting websites on there. So the clubs have stopped the players betting. The FA have got these rules in where you can't bet on any any football, what you're involved in or around the world, but you should get your mate to do it. You can't. They can't stop it. So they can't ban players from, from betting and then they can ring the mate up and say, put me a bet on, that sort of thing. And then they're trying to say, oh, well, we're going to kick out all the betting and all this. And TV companies in the UK were like, right, banning all betting adverts before the game. I was actually reading about it. And I was saying this, this could be a good thing, actually, for the yeah. UK. Yeah. And I'm watching a game on a, on a Saturday. And then just before kickoff, there's an advert. And there's a betting advert. Yes. Yeah. I've just read in the papers about 10 minutes ago that they're going to ban all betting. So until these betting companies are completely kicked out of football, I think that there still will be a problem in, in, in football in the UK, but the culture, it's starting to change, but it's all about money, isn't it? Well, in this part of the world, betting is theoretically yeah. banned. It, it goes on under the table, as you say, yeah. it's, or theoretically goes on mm. under the table. Um, but it, it's, it's worse than a cancer, surely, because look at the problems it got you into. Yeah, it got me into big problems, and it, and it happened so quick. Um, I chose to get, go down that route. And it wasn't really until I went to Sunderland after Cardiff. Um, that was the five million move? No, that yeah, was five, five million, million. Yeah. So yeah. five million pounds of which you get a nice cut. Yeah. So I had a little bit of debt at Cardiff from an online bookmaker. So who, you're on 12 grand a week Yeah. and you're in debt? Yeah, just monthly debt, what you would pay at the end of the month for your, for your credit. Uh, they set a, an amount for you what you can afford and then you pay it back every month. So I've left, I could have stayed at Cardiff, but I decided not to because then my wages are pretty much. But you loved in Cardiff, the football, the football was. Yeah. I'm not squaring this, I'm not, I'm not getting this. I, 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 I was loved in Cardiff, the football, I was playing the best football of my Absolutely. life. Absolutely. But to play in the Premier League, yeah. one. Yeah, okay. To play under Roy Keane. Because you, you, you'd missed, yeah, of course, yeah. You, you missed... So I, I, I left Newcastle and I thought, I'll take one step down and take two forwards. Okay. To, I need to drop down a division to prove myself that I am good enough for the Premier League. All right. So to then to get back in the Premier League uh, with Sunderland, play under Roy Keane, which was a massive thing. Uh, and obviously, your wages, they go up again. You made, you made an interesting thing there. So, are players as calculating as you just said, hey, listen, I know I'm good enough to play for the Premier League, so I will drop down with the ambition. Are, are you as calculating as that? Or, again, I, from somebody who plays at the dreadful level who would have loved to have played conference, you kind of just play as much as you can? I, I had good advice from my agent and my mum and dad that okay. if I'm going to stay at Newcastle, you're not going to play as much. And people nowadays are like, yeah, I played for Man United. I played for Man City. I'm going to sit there as a young boy. I'm going to sit there. They don't want to. They don't want to drop down and go on loan to other clubs because they think in nowadays that playing for this big club, even though they're not playing on a regular basis, but they're part of the team. They think it's a big thing, and it's a, and really it's a stereotype thing yeah. for them. Yeah. The reputation that young players have got now in the UK is ridiculous. The way they strut about and they're buying BMWs and that sort of thing at the age of 17, 18, and you see them on nights out, and I'm like, what you achieved in Do the these game. kids love football? Like, because I, I remember I, you at 16 to 20, you loved football. Yeah, I don't, I, I honestly think, 
about 60-70% of kids in the UK, they're not in the game for the love of it anymore. I think it's the, the stereotype. You see them coming in with the fancy haircuts, everything's on social media, videos and everything. And back in my day, it was just, it just I, didn't, I didn't care how I looked. You can't say back in your day, you're only 36. <laughs> well, 15 years ago. <laughs> nah, um, when, I, when I was at that age, I was... In love with I, the game. I didn't care what I looked like. When you see my, when I scored against Sunderland um, for Newcastle, my hair's all over the place. I just got on that pitch, I wasn't bothered about what I looked at, I just wanted to score goals. Mm. Mm. And nowadays it's like, like, how do I look and my car looks nice and, and that sort of thing, do you know what I mean? It's, it's, football's changed. We'll come back to Sunderland and Roy yeah. Keane in, in a moment. You mentioned their agent and your parents. Yeah. I'm looking for good influences in your life and, and how you're able to push them aside and let this yeah. gambling take control. Let, let, let life just take over yeah. from you. Your folks, they're, they're good people? Yeah, yeah, very good people. Uh, it wasn't, they didn't know anything about my gambling. It wasn't until uh, when I went to Sunderland, uh, I told my agent about all the problems and he says, you need to tell him my dad. And I was like, nah, nah, I can't do this. I was like, oh my God. How am I going to tell my parents about my gambling problems when they've looked after me at a young age? They've, they've brought me whenever I wanted a pair of boots, they've got them, all the new ones, the Predators, etc. Uh, they've took me to training in the rain. What are they going to think of me? And I was like, no, nah, I can't do it. So you knew what you were doing was wrong because you couldn't tell your folks? Yeah, yeah, because I didn't know how they would take it. Uh, they would be questioning why I would have want that when I had the world at my feet yeah. as a young boy. It, any, I could have done anything was possible at the, that young age, uh, how good I was. Um, but So we set a meeting up in, in my mum and dad, I remember, I just bought them a new house and everything. And we set a meeting up and, and they were like, what's going on? I was like, I need to tell you I've got a big gambling problem. And uh, I just broke down in tears in front of them. And I think that's what I needed. I needed to, to open up to people instead of keeping it in myself um, and just be honest and, and open with people. This was when? How, uh, this was in 2008. Okay, so yeah. still relatively... Rel um, yeah, yeah, I still had a, a long way to go okay. in my career. I was still, this was when I just went to Sunderland um, because some of the signing on fee was actually going to, to pay off one of the um, online companies that I had a betting account with um, so then they my mum and dad would question where the money's gone do you know what I mean and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing um, so then when I went to Sunderland we agreed that my mum and dad would take over my finances and control it and give me a certain amount of money uh, to live on in and that sort of thing so your mum and dad actually took control like that? Yeah. Okay, that's great. Because they wanted to help me. Yeah, I've, I get that. They would say... Is why? it still like that? No, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I don't need that anymore. <laughs> good. But no, it was good. They, they, look, addictions are addictions, and you, you've got to try and... I'm, I'm their son, do you know what I mean? And I've still got a long time, a long career ahead of me. So if you try and nip it in the bud as early as possible and, and they, can, they can try and help me and, and that sort of thing. But yeah, they, they were good apart from me, me breaking down in tears. I was, I was devastated telling them. I can imagine. That's yeah. been uh, yeah. very difficult. Yeah. So your agent, your agent knows. Sure, yeah. your agent's got to step in and help. Yeah, he did step in and help. He, uh, he told me Who that. Who was it, sorry? Uh, it was, at the time it was SFX, okay. which has now gone to Wasserman. Yeah. A guy called Simon Bailiff. Mm. who they were a big agency they had yeah. Alan Shearer, Michael Owen, Beckham so they were, they were the top dogs mm. so he said to me he says um, I want you to go and speak to the manager and I was like what? he was like I want you to go and tell the manager you've got a problem and I said to him I said what do you mean I, I can't go and speak to the manager I've just signed for Sunderland and everything and you want me to go and speak to Roy Keane who on the pitch I'm just like anybody scared of Roy Keane, do you know what I mean? And he's like, yeah, go, go and tell him. So I think that my agent had already spoke to the club just to give them a heads up, that sort of thing. Uh, so I went and spoke to Roy. Before the deal had gone through? Or no, after? no, after, after the deal. After the deal. <laughs> They're not that after. Well, 
even if I had told them before the deal, they would have probably said, well, we played against him in the championship when I was at Cardiff and he scored 22 goals. So for five million, it was big money at the time, but they've just been promoted to the Premier League. They could possibly take a risk. Um, but yeah, I told him after the deal had happened, um, I, said, I just said to him, Roy, I need, I need help. And he was like, what is it? I says, well, obviously I've just been divorced, got a big gambling problem and that sort of thing. He was like, I like your honesty, Chops. He actually said that, he says, I like your honesty. And then he started telling me about some problems he had. And we just, we, do you know what? We just clicked straight there between us. And I, Roy, Keane, Roy Keane was brilliant for me. He went, right, okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna speak to Peter Kay uh, at the Sport and Chance Clinic, which is, was set up by Tony Adams. Uh, I'm going to speak to him, I'm going to get you in straight away. He says, get yourself down there, get yourself fixed and everything, come back and score me goals. So, yeah, it was, it, it was, it, it was really good. Um, I was scoring goals for Sunderland uh, in the Premier League and Roy had done as much as possible to, to try and help me and Sunderland Football Club did as well. So he's not this big, scary animal that goes <laughs> around kicking his grandmother? Do you know what? He, he, Roy Keane's a winner. And when you see how he played, he, he played like that in training, uh, even, even with us when he was the manager. He would do in box, little small boxes and he, he didn't want to go in the middle, he wanted to win the ball back. Um, I see Roy Keane as more of a personal friend rather than just my manager. Okay. Uh, he tried to, to help me as much as possible because he, he knows about these problems himself and he's, he's look, he's played for the biggest club but in the world. But he comes across as so me. angry and surly and uh, very disciplinarian mm. on any time you see him on the yeah. television. Yeah, which surprises people when I say he's actually a nice guy. Uh, I actually got on well with him. Every day after training, chops my doors open. Do you want to have a, a green tea? Because he used to love green tea. If you want to have a green tea, coffee, you're welcome to come in. And Roy Keane was, was brilliant. And yeah, I've seen, I've seen the bad side to him. Uh, in a dressing room, but that's only because he, he's a winner and he wanted to, his standards were so high when, when he was the manager of Sunderland and he wanted to, to make that club as, as, as good as possible. And I think he probably, he probably realises himself that he set the standards too high for the football club at the time, but with players, yeah, some players don't like him, but I, I don't have any disrespect for Roy Keane. And at this time you were going through Sporting Chance, you were getting, yeah. was it counselling? <clears throat> Did you have to go to meetings? Yeah, so they couldn't get me into the clinic uh, so quick. So we went to um, a hospital place uh, in London called the Capio Nightingale Hospital. So I was staying in a hotel in Anmark, going to the clinic, and round the corner was a betting shop. No. <laughs> so I'd be telling no, Sunderland, Josh, telling Roy no. Keane, that I'm going to the clinic nine till five, so boring, and then ending up in the bookies at night time. And I so know. I was getting help, but I wasn't helping myself, if you know what I mean. I know. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So I've done all, opened up to everyone about getting help. They've given me the help and the support, but I wasn't helping myself. And that's the problem. Sheesh. Yeah. So that was the, f the first time I went to, really, to the clinic. Okay, so your gambling problems continue, yeah. not in the same, same volume, same kind of silly amounts uh, of money being spent? No, nah, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have said it was, it, it was, it was that stupid, no. Um, I was gambling more and more on a regular basis, but I wouldn't be, like, the amounts wouldn't be 30, 40, that sort of thing. It was, because my mum and dad used to control my account, it would start to lower down, but I was, I was still betting. How, having gone through what you've gone through, how, what advice would you give for, for kids who actually start to gamble? How can they, how can they stop this spiral I getting think out of control? If you, the, the main thing is you've got to want to stop. You've got to realise you, that you have a problem. I, I didn't, I never thought I had a problem, never thought. No matter what people were telling me, I was like, nah, nah, I'm in control. And they, they could see it, you're not in control. And I used to think they were being nasty and having a go at me. But you've got to realise that you've got a problem, you need help, and if you, if you don't get that to, then you, you, your life's going to be horrendous. Because that, 
what you've done there, the sporting mm. sporting clinic, yeah, and yeah. then going to the yeah. bookies is yeah. is incredible. How long did that carry on for? So son, so that son, was a week. I I was there for a week. Yeah. Um, then I would come back to to Sunland train, play games. Uh, I played on a regular basis. Yes. At Sunland, scoring goals, kept them in the Premier League. And then it wasn't. And then it was really when Roy Keane left the club and Ricky Sabrazia took over that. My time at Sunderland, uh, I wasn't enjoying it anymore. Roy wasn't there to to speak to. I'm not saying Ricky wasn't there, but I didn't really see eye to eye with Ricky like I did with Roy. Um, and that's when I decided to to bench yourself again and, yes. and go back to Cardiff. Go back to Cardiff. The team that I loved. I loved the fans and. Like I said many times, I could have signed for other clubs, but Cardiff was in my heart. And I decided to, to go back and um, try and get them promoted to the Premier League. And was it a disappointment going back, or was it, was it no, as good no, as the no. first time? It wasn't quite as good as the first time, was it? Or? No, no, I, I believe that it, I enjoyed it. I had a, I had a great season. Um, we got to the playoff final. The Reading game, huh? Well, the Blackpool game in the Sorry, final, Reading yes. was the season yeah, after. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we got to the final, um, and then you, you, oh, you're playing Blackpool, and you're, you're thinking, all the teams in the championship, you go through every single team, who would you want to play in a final? You've got a great chance, you've got to play Blackpool. They just sneaked in as well, I think they'd be yes, Forest yes, yeah. in the semis. Uh, and I was thinking, what a chance this is. Cardiff City in the Premier League. And Cardiff decamped. Yeah. They, 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 the, the place was empty, it was great. Yeah. Um, and that's when the new owners just taken over. Mm -hmm. um, Vincent Tan took over the club. Yeah. We had a meeting and everything. He was brilliant, trying to encourage us motivation. Um, but I believe some players didn't turn up on the day. The big occasion got to them. Because if we played the football we were playing on a regular basis, we were, we were no disrespect to Blackpool, but they, wouldn't, they weren't in our league when we were playing at our best. But some players didn't turn up on the big occasion. The disappointment of, of this conversation is uh, we haven't spoken much about football. Yeah. Which is, which is a real pity because of your youth development mm. and the teams you've played for. So talk to me a little bit about the football. So players not turning up on the big day, how does that happen? Did Michael Chopper turn up on the day? Did you make the same runs? Did you, was yeah, your first well, touch as good? I, 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 not just because it's me, but I, I was brilliant that day. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I hit the bar in the first seven minutes. I think I scored after 14 minutes. Yeah. Uh, we were 2-1 down, I think it was, in the second half, and I've hit the bar again. And I knew then that it wasn't, wasn't going to be my day. Um, yeah, I scored at Wembley and that sort of thing, but we've lost 3-2 and we haven't been promoted to the Premier League. And you've played 46 games and then you've played two playoff games and your season's ended. Was that the most devastating football moment of your career? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, I, I honestly believe that I was going to be the man to get them to the Premier League because they, they brought me back to the club. I paid 4.7 million yeah, or something. Yeah, million, yeah. Uh, what, the, what they sold me for. Um, new stadium, fans were brilliant. Sell out at Wembley and we couldn't, we couldn't keep, deliver what what I had promised. What was your reaction? Did you go out? Did you go and gamble? Did you go and have a, a, a night out on the town? What? We we had originally planned that um, afterwards we would go to uh, a nightclub in London and, and celebrate. <laughs> but then we lost. A lot of the lads were disappointed, so the club put on uh, a function in the hotel, okay. at, at the Landmark Hotel, because. It, it's been a tough season, do you know what I mean? And yeah, you're disappointed and that sort of thing, but um, they just tried to get the, the spirit back up and put on a little bit of a party, but it wasn't the you same. You don't want to celebrate. Nah, you, no. Nah, it was, you were devastated. <sighs> so, how do you pick yourself up the next year? Well, you go again, don't you? You, you, you dream, you believe. Uh, we kept the same team. Uh, the gaffer brought in a couple of more players, and he was it still Dave? Still, yeah, yeah, Dave still was Dave, still okay. there. Yeah, and then we were really, really pushing, and we we, we were close to to getting promote automatic promotion. Yeah, 
Uh, I think we played Middlesbrough, I think, and we, we, we got battered towards the end of the season, 3-0, and that, if we had won that, we would have went second, I think, with about three or four games to go. But we believed that was the year because he brought Bellamy in on loan from Man City, which was a massive coup. Aaron Ramsey came on loan from Arsenal, came back to Cardiff. Um, we, had, we had big players that were big game players, but we just... We played Redden in the in the uh, in the semi-finals and we we got beat. We just it, it just once again it wasn't was nothing. And I was thinking, is it ever going to be Cardiff's year? And then later on, a few years later, it was it, it yeah. was a year. And yeah, it was really pleased, but yeah. it, just a shame that it wasn't me that had been part of that team. Let's talk about some of the big players. Craig Bellamy. Yeah. Um, you, I've read that you think that he's one of the guys who. Kind of got you out of Cardiff. Well, I was at Newcastle with Bellas, and at Newcastle, Bellas was young, and Bellas could have an argument with himself in front of the mirror. He was that type of person. But Bellas was a, a brilliant player, brilliant. Uh, he was obviously with the injuries he had, his diet, his fitness regime was was spot on. Uh, but I'd, when, I'd imagine a difficult man to get on with. Yeah, yeah. But when it came to Cardiff after Man City, I've seen a totally different person. He was more relaxed. His, his, his fitness and diet... Craig Bellamy relaxed? Yeah, he was, he was totally, <laughs> totally different person. Okay. I, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and uh, his diet was still there. He's training because he had, I think he had a couple of bad knee injuries. And he had, to, he had a proper personal trainer. He can only train on certain days. Um, but then we played uh, Bristol City away. And um, so I... Because I was going through these problems, I had a, a motivation guy in, in Newcastle who I, I used to train with off-season and, and used to speak to on a regular basis, Steve Black. I think Joey Barton's used him as well. Joey Barton's really close. And he used to send me a text message during the game so that I would get it at half-time just to keep me focused and keep me motivated. Um, and I've come, in to the, come into the dressing room and I'm like, gone through my pockets. Right. Hey, where's my phone? I'm sure, I put my phone in my pockets, checking, checking my shoe, checking my watch. Right, it's not there. I was just going, gaffer, someone's nicked my phone. He's doing his team talk. So, gaffer, someone's nicked my phone, and like Bellamy's looking at me, thinking, what's he talking about? So I, I then found out that the physio had took my phone to keep me concentrated on my games because they thought that I was. But isn't that reasonable? Isn't that a reasonable thing, a point of action from them? To take it, uh, to, well, yeah, they to get you focused. Well, yeah, they wanted, but I was in a routine where I was doing it every game. But they thought that I was looking at yes. football scores. They yes. they thought because, oh, he's a gambler. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. He's checking the scores. Well, I paper. am. As you're telling yeah, me yeah, the yeah. story, I'm thinking exactly. So that. they, but they didn't realise that I actually had a motivation speaker and who I used to train with back in Newcastle that would send me the text because I used to keep a lot to myself. Uh, so I was like where's my phone and this sort of thing. So they're like, well, well there's your phone. I was like, look, what are you taking my phone for? Are we, we think you're gambling, you're not focused on the game, you're checking the scores and that sort of thing. So I went, look, there's a text. Well, there's a text off Steve Black, check it. Well, there's my phone, you can have it. Going back out to play. So it was one of them things, do you know what I mean? But that kind of spoiled the relationship so, well, between think, you and Bellas. And then I found out that Bellas had told the, the physio, the fitness coach to, to hide my phone when I've gone out. So, are you an explosive character? Do you react to that? Well, at the time I did, yeah, because I was like, I want, yeah, my, I want my phone. How, how, so, you, you, I'm, I'm, I was like... Pun punchy? No, nah, I wasn't punchy, no, 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 not that bad. I was just like, going, pacing up and down. I was like, Where, where's the phone, where's the phone? Do you know what I mean? And I'm thinking, what, what's happened? Someone's nicked it, that sort of thing. Um, but then I left Cardiff uh, at the end of that season. And I think Bella's probably told the owners, look, you need to get him out, he's a bad apple. Um, bad for the players and that sort of thing. Uh, which, he only knew me from Cardiff for probably three, four months. Do you, do you understand know I mean? why people think you might be a bad apple? I do understand, yeah, because I was, a, I was a gambler. And I had that reputation of being a gambler and you can't get rid of it. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the football side, not a bad apple. I've only got a reputation of being a gambler. If you go by football ability, goal scored, a lot, a lot of teams will take me, but a lot of managers didn't trust me mm. because they had heard 
that I was a big gambler. And they've got to trust you. A manager's got to trust you. Well, that's why Dave Jones was brilliant. Okay, and Roy Keane, as you said. Yeah, and Dave trusted me. It was like, Dave would always say to me, I, I used to go back to Newcastle quite a lot to see my family and stuff like, obviously with the divorce, it was, it was hard. So I used to try and get back as much as possible. Um, so we'd be like, produce for me on a Saturday. You do what you want, go back home, anything you want. And the players couldn't believe it. I like, always find that, uh, uh, when people so, do that, I yeah. find that remarkable so management a lot, style. A, a lot of players, I think me and, me and Jay Brothroyd, yeah, which was my strike partner at the time, Dave had to handle us different to the rest of the lads. And you're both out in Asia. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what does that say? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, he, he, had to, he had to handle me and Jay totally different to the rest of the lads because we were, we were different, but we were producing on a... So on to a conformist like me, uh, I'm, I'm, I like the <laughs> rules, I like the regulations, you're, you're a nightmare to cope with. Well, I was, but I was producing on the pitch. Okay. So as a team, and a, a lot of the lads will tell you, we, they can't have a go at me. They can't have a go at me for going to Newcastle. Because I used to go to Newcastle, I would f fly back to Newcastle, and then uh, come back down uh, on a Tuesday, go back to Newcastle and then drive back down on a Thursday morning for training. Wow. So it was like two, three times a week I was back and forwards. And the lads were like, w can't say anything to them because they're producing the goods. So when you stopped producing the goods, when you went to, to Blackpool and, and uh, sorry, Ipswich, 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 Ipswich I went to Ipswich first, And yeah. Blackpool, the goals dried up. Ipswich first, yeah, I scored 14. Uh, obviously, Paul Jewell was brilliant with me and that's, the second time I went into rehab was when I was at Ipswich. With Paul? Yeah, so Ipswich knew about all my problems, knew about the debt and everything. Um, they helped me, Ipswich were, Ipswich were brilliant. They made sure that I was banned from all the, all the betting shops in the town, so I couldn't go in. Um, they actually employed, um, there was an Olympic rower, uh, Steve. They employed him to come and do one-to-one -one sessions with me. Steve Pinner or Steve Regave or no? No. Okay. Um, Doesn't make matter. Okay. The name will come. Okay. Um, they um, actually employed. They, so the second season, I think Paul's gone to them and said, right, chops all the problems he's had in the first season, bang with 14 goals, and we finished bottom half of the table. Yeah. If his head's right, and if I bring the right players in, we've got a chance of getting promoted. So first of all, what happened is, uh, they sent me on a fitness camp to uh, America, California, the okay. ashram. Okay. So <laughs> I got a phone call up off the fitness coach, Andy, Andy Little, and he went, you've killed me. I went, what do you mean? He says, the gaffer and the chairman, Marcus Evans and Simon Clegg, the... Uh, you've had some characters as chairman, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Um, they've sent you to a fitness camp. And I'm like, what do you mean? He went, nah, gaffer believes if, you, if you're fully fit this year, got a good chance and everything. So a pint of coke in hand and... <laughs> <laughs> so I went to the fitness camp uh, in California. He was like, you've killed me because I've had to cut my holiday short and all that. I was like, Andy, I'm sorry, I'll go on my own. He went, nah, nah, they want me to go with you, so you're doing it properly. So I went to California, uh, a place called the Ashram, and it was, it was expensive, it was like 10 grand a week, do you know what I mean? It wasn't, it wasn't cheap for them. But I lost like four kilograms in, in seven days and I was, I was flying, I was come back training, the lads were like, what you've been doing you've, I was lean and everything it was brilliant they were they were they had put a lot in me to to try and get the club to succeed and then uh, things so that was at the beginning of the season and then um, I had a, a lot of driving offenses speeding and that sort of thing so I was I was going to court a lot Getting what? banned from driving. Well, I, I, I just. So thought, where's the self-discipline of well, this? A professional this is, athlete. This is the thing. I didn't have any. Oh yeah. So I was. I, I, I remember one time we went to watch England against Wales. I was with three of the lads. I, t I drove there. Uh, it was about 10:30. Games finished. So I'm just bombing it back along the A14 back to to Ipswich, and I'm doing like 120. And I'm seeing these blue lights. Blue, blue, blue. And the lads are like. What, what are you going to do, Chops? And I'm like, nah, nah, just keep going, keep going, they won't catch me. So I just kept going. And uh, they've obviously got the red when I've, or they've, they've checked the cameras or something. And so a couple of days later, the, the police are at the training ground, and I'm like, oh my God. 
what more do I want to bring to the, to the club that have tried to help me? So eventually I went to court and the club sent their representatives with me. Do you know what, Ipswich, Ipswich all the clubs, right? Ipswich would give me the most help. They, they, oh, Ipswich okay. were really good. And I know I've been disrespectful to the fans at times and stuff like that, which is, is what happens. But Ipswich were the club that really helped me. They were a proper family club and the people within the club, um, I, you can't thank them enough. But So I bring these problems and I thought, play the Premier League, you're bigger than the law, you can do what you want, that sort of thing, do you know what I mean? Uh, like, like you go on, you, 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 I've never grown up sort of thing. And I'm just, I'm just a kid that goes out on the weekend and, and playing football. And then, so I've gone to, they sent me to rehab, the proper sport and chance clinic. And I was there for two weeks, I think it was. But they had it that I'd go to the sport and chance clinic, come out on a Friday night, play a game on Saturday, and then go back in. No, but, no, bet, no betting shops? No, no, no. Now okay. no, this was like you're surrounded and you, they know where you are like 24/7. No betting shop. And I, I, I knew myself that I needed. This is what I needed. I needed. I realised I had a problem and, and I needed my needed help. So yeah, we. Uh, I played on the Saturday and we, we played Cardiff away. I don't care. I, I scored. I don't remember Simon Simon Clegg going. Paul, he's, he's fixed, he's, he's sorted, his head's right, it's, it's everything. <laughs> so I said to them, I said, listen, I'm not fixed, it's just natural ability. I'm, do you know what I mean? It's, it's a long process. Uh, so I, I, I came out on the Saturday, I remember it well, because it, it was against Cardiff and I scored. Um, but then afterwards, uh, the results weren't really going that well for Paul. Paul got sacked, Mick McCarthy took over. Um, Mick didn't really see me in the plans, he brought his own players in. Um, and then just parted ways with, with Ipswich. We're coming to the end. We've got we've got a time a time yeah. shed, a schedule on this. You're at the, we're at the Mox Workspace <laughs> um, we're in Kuala Lumpur. Um, this has been a, a podcast called Deep Sheet with Michael Chopra. If you want to subscribe, like and subscribe. We'll be doing more of these deep sheets. We haven't actually got all the way through the, the no. uh, Michael Chopra story. We may, we'll maybe continue this yeah, at, yeah. At, at another time because. Uh, it's a fascinating story, but like and subscribe. Thank you to Mox for the workspace and the development area that we've got. And thank you to Michael no, Chopper you. because you've kind of opened your heart to us here. Well, you have to, don't you? There's a lot of people in my position. I get Twitter feeds and text messages all the time. How do I, how do I stop and that sort of thing? So I think to myself now, well, if I'm honest and open about my life, people will look into it and read about it, then it'll help One them. sentence to those who might have a gambling problem. I think you've got to realise you've got the problem and just ask for help. Uh, there's a load of numbers out there, there's a load of people that want to help and I think you've just got to go and seek help. I think that's the main concern. People are too embarrassed to, to say they've got a problem and they don't seek help. Michael Chopper, thank, thank you, you. Thanks.